Okay, so the profession should regularly update or regularly update auditors on new practices and procedures that will improve their independence, right? So <clears throat> that's one of the key things that professional bodies will do. You know, that's what one of the key things the ICA will do. They will continue to suggest you know, new practices and procedures that would help for auditors to, you know, meet the independent standards. So let's talk here about non-audit services again. So when we talk about non-audit services, I think we've talked about this already. I think we've talked about this already. So when we talk about non-audit services, we mean Things like taxation work, um, IT work, consultancy, and all that. And I think we talked about it previously. So let's just move on to confidentiality. 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 So what's the basic principle when it comes to confidentiality here? What's, what's the principle? <laughs> when it comes to confidentiality. Any clues, please? Uh, I think confidentiality, we basically look, looking at the non-disclosure of information uh, obtained from the client during the audit. Okay, okay. So are there circumstances under which um, under which the auditor will be required to um, disclose? Are there circumstances under which the auditor will be required to disclose? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, please. What will be some of the circumstances? Uh, I think you can disclose when the law requires you to disclose. So, uh, in a court case, when you are called to give a testimony or you are called to testify, yes, you are called to testify, you are okay. obliged to disclose by the law. Okay, that's a good one. Nimatu. Nimatu, I think you raised your hand. Okay. So confidentiality is a fundamental principle of professional behavior. That any information that you obtain in the course of your professional work should not be disclosed to others. Unless it is required by law, unless there's a duty to do so, um, or, or there's a duty to do so, or it's required by law, basically. So that's something to keep in mind. So you need to keep in mind that there's a baseline um, requirement for confidentiality. There's a baseline requirement for confidentiality and that you always need to be confidential because the information that the client gives to you, right? It's very precious information. No one has it. It's just because you're in a position as an auditor. That's why you have that information. That's why you have that information. So you should not disclose it unless the exceptions require it. So in the, the auditing work, working papers, Right. When we say working papers, audit working papers, what do we mean? When we say audit working papers, audit working papers. Okay. Let me just define it. Well, or will anyone want to take care? Okay. So auditing, when we say audit work papers, they are basically documents, right? Which 
um, record, um, which record the activities or the procedures that the auditor undertook um, during the auditing of the financial statement. So during the course of the audit, you know, the auditor will have to document things and that's contained in the audit work papers. So the accountant's work papers, which contain confidential client information are the property of the accountant. They are the property of the auditor and should not be made available to outside parties. However, there are situations where government agencies might require to see, um, might require to see, might require to see the accountant's work papers. So in such cases, you know, the accountant should act in the best interest of the client. You know, it's not a no or a yes. The accountant should act in the best interest of the client. If he feels that releasing the papers in the, is in the best inter, interest of the client and the client doesn't have any objections, then you should make the, you should make the papers available. You know, you should make the papers, working papers available. You know, there are times where for quality control purposes, the authorities may want to see a sample of the working papers to see how documentation was done. To see how documentation was done. Was the documentation okay or was it just a mess? It was just a mess. So they would want to see that. They will want to see that. And here it's not about best interest. If they want to, they have doubts about the quality of the work. Um, sorry, here it's about best interest. You, you adopt a best interest approach, you know, so you allow the authorities to review the papers, you know, if it's in the best interest of the practice and its clients. You know, there are times when the, the authorities will come and say, hey, we want to see the, a sample of working papers for maybe Go, Echo Bank, and um, GCB. They have to provide, the, you know, they want to check the quality. I want to check the quality. Any questions so far? Does anyone have any questions or thoughts? Anything going through your mind? Anything going through your mind? Okay. So what do we mean by conflict of interest? Conflict of interest. What does it mean? When we say there's conflict of interest, what does it mean? What's a general definition for conflict of interest? Felix, would you like to help us? What's a general definition of conflict of interest? Any of you? Okay, Nimatu. So let me give an example of what conflict of interest is. Okay. Fly guy. Yeah, go ahead. Go okay, ahead. so as assuming I'm working with um um local government, okay, and mm -hmm. then um they asked someone to provide stationery. Mm -hmm. Then um, I decide to go and provide stationery for local governments. Mm -hmm. um, that means like there'll be conflict of interest because- um, Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay. Please go ahead. We are listening now, Nimati. Hello, Nimati. Hello. 
Yeah, we can hear you. So can you hear, please? Yes, we can hear now. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Nimati, please unmute. You're on mute. The microphone is on mute. Okay, okay. I think there's a problem with her phone. Mm -hmm. But the example she was giving was a very good example. So conflict of interest occurs where a person is in a position to derive personal benefits from the decisions that they make in their official capacity. So the example she was giving where you're working for local government and they say, oh, they need pens. Then you say, oh, I'll supply pens. You know, I'll supply pens. You are working in procurement so yeah. and you say, I'll supply pens. So there'll be a conflict of interest right there. In audit profession too, there's also the issue of conflict of interest. There's also that issue. It's a huge issue. But conflict of interest can arise under two situations. Number one, conflicts between members and clients. When there are conflicts between members and clients, um, it causes a clash between those two parties. Members, meaning audits and auditors and clients. And when there are also conflicts between, there could also be conflicts between competing clients competing clients. So let's explain. Let's explain what we mean by this. So members or firms should not accept or continue an engagement where there's a conflict of interest between the member or firm and its client. If there's a conflict of interest between the member of the, the firm and its clients, you know, you should not accept or continue the engagement. You should not accept or continue the engagement. Because in such situations, it might, it might likely affect the judgment of, um, it might affect the judgment of the firm. It might affect the judgment of the firm. Very crucial, very crucial. So what are some safeguards that you can use here? Yeah. What are some safeguards? What are some of the safeguards? You must always review. You must always review your relationships with clients on a regular basis. You must always review it. If you have any relationship with your clients, you must constantly review it. You must constantly review it. Very, very key. Very, very key. Very, very key. And you must also be aware of potential conflicts of interest when you are taking on a client. When you are taking on a client. So that's it between conflicts between members and clients. There's also conflicts between competing clients. Conflicts between competing clients. And what do we mean by this? What do we mean by com conflict between competing clients? So it, there's, there are situations where a firm might ask for two clients that are in direct competition with each other. So let's take, um, it's interesting, let's take Vodafone and MTN, right? Let's take Vodafone and MTN. Let's take Vodafone and MTN. Let's say PwC is auditing both of them. Vodafone and MTN are competing clients. Of course, they are complete competing clients, right? So a firm might, there are situations where a firm might act 
um, for two clients that are in direct competition with each other. The firm has a professional duty of confidentiality. And so we'll not disclose confidential information about one client company to its competitor. Very key, you see? So if you are auditing, let's say, Vodafone and MTN, right? you should always be careful as an auditor not to disclose um, competitor information. You shouldn't do that. You should not do that at all because once you are doing that, you are hurting your clients, whichever way you are doing it, you are hurting your clients. You are hurting your clients. So you should not do that. So when you are auditing competing clients, you always need to take note of that. You always need to take note of that. That's very, very important. That's very, very important. That's very, very important. So always keep that in mind. Always keep that in mind, please. Always keep that in mind. So the approach the accounting firm should take will be a matter of, you know, judgment, you know, because what you want here is that you want to handle the clients, the two clients, without any interferences. You know, if you see that you accept one client and it will make you preju prejudice towards one, then you should probably shouldn't accept the engagement. So, for example, a possible safeguard will be that anytime you have a situation like that, you should carefully consider it as an auditor. You should carefully consider it as an auditor. Always consider it. Is this um, assurance engagement that I'm going to accept? Is it um, where my client is in direct competition with another? Um, is it going to you know, affect my judgment? Is it going to affect my judgment? Very, very key. Extremely key. Is it going to affect my um, judgment? If it is, then you have to advise yourself. And you also have to carefully manage the clients. So one strategy would be that you don't use the same audit team for MTN and Vodafone. You have to change the audit team. You know, what I mean by audit team is that people who are actually doing the audit. It might be 10 people, seven people, 15 people, you know, and all that. So you can use, if you use the same audit team, you know, it might not necessarily help because people can talk and people might leak information and all that. People might leak information and all that. So always remember that. Always remember that. Please, always remember that. Conflicts between competing clients. Any questions so far? Any question? Let me ask you this question. In Ghana, is there any auditor that audits competing clients? Does anyone have a clue? Is there any auditor who audits competing clients? Does anyone know? Does anyone yeah, know? It can, it can be possible. Yeah, but yeah, it's possible. But like, do you have any example? Do you have any example? Uh, no, please. Okay. Does anyone know of any example where the auditor is auditing competing clients? Does anyone have an example? Okay. No, not really, not naturally comes to mind now, but um, yeah, because in my mind, no, I think, I think, I think one the of the sector. Sorry, yeah, the banking sector. That's what I was yeah, about to say. The banking sector might have, yeah, because yes. uh, most of them, yeah, the banking sector. 
because um, some of some of these um, um, bands, you know, um, they usually go on for the top four, top five. So um, definitely, uh, looking at the number we have, the, there's there's that huge. I have not really checked, but I can see the possibility on, in in that aspect. I can check later and see. Yeah, I think I think that's that would be very true. Mm-hmm. That would be very true because the bands, you know, the bands, I think that an auditor might audit competing clients in that case. In my audit competing clients, if I'm being very, very fair. If I'm being very, very fair, then my audit competing clients. Okay. So are there any questions on these conflicts? And then any questions so far, anything you need me to clear up before we move on? I hope you are getting the picture because this is very, very crucial when it comes to audits. Can I move on? Yes, please. Okay. So there's something we call corporate financial advice, right? So there are certain types of financial services that may create threats to independence. It may hamper things like advocacy and, it might create, sorry, things like advocacy and self-review threats. You know, it might create that. It might create that, you know. So, uh, you need to watch, you want to watch it very carefully when it comes to corporate financial advice. So, what do we mean by corporate financial advice? When the audit firm should not engage in things like promoting or underwriting an audit client shares. The audit firm should not be involved in raising capital, for instance, raising equity capital for the clients, or even promoting or even dealing in such things. These are financial services that will hamper the independence or the objectivity of the auditor. Very, very important. Very, very important. And they are also, the auditors should not also provide um, corporate finance advice where, you know, the potency of that advice, you know, has a direct link, you know, has a a link with an accounting treatment or a presentation in the financial statement that's being audited. You know, if you are, if you are going through, if you're going to give us some advice and that advice has an impact on the financial statements you're auditing. Can't you see there's a threat to independence there? Yeah, there's a threat. So when you are giving financial advice, the auditor must be very, very aware, very, very aware, very, very aware, you know, very, very aware. So, um, That's a very, very crucial thing that anyone who is an auditor must understand. So I said here that in other cases, safeguards such as not making management decisions, an independent review of the audit or corporate finance work and using individuals who are not members of the audit team should be considered, you know. So these are some of the safeguards, right? These are some of the safeguards. If you are involved in the auditing of the financial statement, then you should not be given finance advice. It will impair your independence. It will impair your independence. That's very, very important. It will impair your independence. It will impair your independence. So the auditor should always be on the lookout for that. The auditor should always be on the lookout for that. And when it comes to the whole strategic case study, right? One, that's one of the things you should look out for. Situations where you know, the auditor might seem to have given some financial advice um, that has an impact on the financial statement that they themselves audited, that they themselves audited. 
that they themselves added. So in your own words, why do you think this is a, it's not a good idea, it's a bad idea to give financial advice? In your own words, why do you think this is so? Can anyone give it a shot? Can anyone give it a shot, please? In your own words, why do you think that giving, offering financial advice might impair independence? Okay, offering, of, first of all, offering financial advice mm -hmm. to a, a firm or to your insurance client will lead to uh, self review to it, as we've discussed earlier on. So it's like writing an exams and marking it yourself. So then it may really, really affect the independence of the firm. Okay. But, but, but why do you think it's so? Like, why do you think, I'm just giving financial advice. So, but why do you think? It, yes, if you give the financial advice, mm -hmm. Well, they may act on your financial advice to, mm -hmm. they may act on it. So when they act on it, that financial advice, then you come in to review that, um, let's say, that component that you give the advice and they acted upon will lead to the self-review to it. It's like, say, I, okay, if you found an issue with it, they will tell that, oh, but you told me to do it. So, okay. and you okay. are, why are you qualifying it? Exactly. Okay. So, I see what you mean. That that is it. I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Okay. Anyone has an addition to what he said? Thank you for that submission. Anyone has an addition? Why do you think offering financial advice? What kind of threats will it pose? You know, what kind of threats will it pose? Oh, does anyone, I just want you to explain it in your own words so that um, you can understand, you know, that's all I'm trying to do. Does anyone want to take a shot at it? Okay, it looks like no one wants to talk about it. So it creates all kinds of threats, self-review threats, um, advocacy threats. And so um, it's not a good idea for auditors to be involved, basically. I think everyone has gotten it. So I'll just move on to the next point. The next point. So we are still talking about advising clients advising clients. So there are situations where there will be takeover bids, right? There'll be takeover, takeover bids, sorry, or share issues. And in such situations, sometimes auditors are often asked to give advice, you know? However, where clients are involved in a contested takeover bid, the auditors could find themselves in a position where they are potentially acting for both parties, you know? So it's possible for the auditor to find themselves in a situation where they're acting for the one who is taking over their clients, basically. You know. It's possible for the auditor to act for both parties. So in such a situation, the, it might impair the auditor's uh, objectivity and the auditor might not give professional advice, which is in the interest of both parties because the auditor might possess confidential information about both of the parties, you know? So it's a very, very tricky spot to be in as an auditor, very, very tricky spot to be in. Very, very tricky spot to be in. So let's say um, 
let me give an example so it's a lot more relatable. Um, which company acquired Airtel? Is it Airtel? Airtel was first what? I've forgotten their, their name. Zane. 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 Yeah. Did someone acquire Zane? Give, please give me an example of an acquisition that has happened in Ghana. Like someone came to buy the company or something. GCB um, acquiring um, first um, uh, UT Bank and uh, I think First Capital Bank. Bank, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. okay. So let's say um, Deloitte is auditing GCB and it's auditing First Capital Bank. And GCB is saying that, oh, we want to acquire. First Capital Bank and Deloitte is auditing both of them. What does it expose Deloitte to? First of all, Deloitte has confidential information on each of them, right? Secondly, secondly, um, secondly, um, Deloitte giving professional advice to GCB may not necessarily be objective. It may not be objective at all, at all, at all, at all. Because, you know, Deloitte is in the middle of two clients. Deloitte in, is in the middle of two clients. So what, what are the guidelines saying here? What are the guidelines saying here? There's no reason, in principle, there's no reason not to ask for both parties when there's a contested takeover. However, a firm should not be the main advisor for both parties. You know, if the firm is the main advisor, that's where, you know, the issue is. That's where the issue is. That's where the issue is. Very, very important. Very, very important. If there is a situation where the auditor feels like they have some, you know, confidential information and feel that, like, they think that their position in this whole um, take takeover scenario, um, their position in this whole takeover sin scenario is going to, like, affect their, their respect, is going to affect their image, they should then take steps to seek advice from the regulatory authority. You know, so I said here that if the accountants are in possession of material confidential information and feel that their position in this respect is questionable, they should take advice from appropriate financial regulatory authority. A typical example is the stock exchange involved in the takeover or the national regulator of the financial statements. So if the accountant is possessing some confidential information and they feel like their position in, in regards to this is questionable, then you can always go to the regulator and ask for advice. That's why the regulator is there. If you are faced with situations like this, you go to the regulator and seek advice on the next steps to take, basically, the next steps to take. So advising clients is a very tricky area. You know, and as we've already talked about, when they are competing clients, you are doing it for two clients. You know, you're in the middle of two clients. It can be very, very tricky as an auditor. So that's something you need to come um, keep in mind as always. That's something you need to keep in mind. That's something you need to keep in mind. So um, I don't know if anyone has any questions. Any questions, any contributions, just let me know. Any questions? Is everything clear? Please give me feedback. Is everything clear? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. yeah it's fine with me, Isaac. Okay. Okay, if everything is clear then, um, let me just do a quick recap and then we can call it a day. So today we talked about fundamental principles. We said these principles were established by, you know, um, the IS bar body 
or the IS barcode. And we said this IS barcode is what uh, the ICA de deploys or what the ICA goes for. We established five principles and we use the acronym COPY, confidentiality, objectivity, professional competence, professional behavior, integrity. Then we went on to talk about independence. We talked about independence and we talked about safeguard. We talked about threats to independence. We looked at different scenarios and the guidelines that the code gives. We talked about um, the safeguards to these threats. Then we moved on to talk about confidentiality. We talked about conflict of interest. Um, talked about confidentiality first and talked about how the auditor has sensitive information and should not disclose it. And we then went on to talk about um, conflict of interest and offering corporate financial advice. So this is where everything comes together, right? That, you know, this is a core fundamental of audits. So I just wanted to recap so you have an idea of what we did today. So if no one has any questions, then we would call it a day. And so have a nice one. I'll be sending you the slides and the, and the, and the recording as well. So thank okay. you very much for joining and have a good uh, night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.